you were the pioneer of digital nomads. <laughs> Go! Absolutely. There was no digital, but I was a nomad. The most adventurous, moving to San Francisco. Because I, th I think if you can show up in a new place and create a life, it's an amazing skill. I just adore 20-somethings. I love working with them. I love feeling like I'm making a difference in someone's life when it can really matter a lot. Dr. Meg J, often referred to as the patron saint of striving youth by the New York Times. Dr. J is a clinical psychologist who has spent 25 years working with 20-somethings, guiding them through one of the most transformative decades of life. Her TED Talk, Why 30 is Not the New 20, has inspired millions to take charge of their early adult years. It was super hard, super constraining. However, once I had my degree, the minute I got that piece of paper, I'm going to take that PhD and I'm going to do what I want to do. And I never worked for anyone again. In her latest book, The 20 Something Treatment, Dr. J explores how young adults can build essential skills needed to thrive. The question is like, not do I have my dream job now, but can I get there from here? So don't try. <laughs> your learning curve maps onto your earning curve. When I was in my 20s, I was like, this sucks every single day. Just 20 somethings have long been the age group most likely to struggle with their mental health. It's also what you talk about in your book. You know, your 20s will probably not be the best years of your life. Most of what 20 somethings are grappling with are situational. What is the best way for 20 somethings to set reassurance for themselves? How to tolerate uncertainty. Most people would say they're 30 30s are definitely better than their 20s. And yeah. your 30s are really your chance to make that turn. Hi, Dr. McJay. Hi, Lydia. How are you? Great I'm to be good. here. How are you? Thank you so much for being on the show. So today we have the patron saint of striving youth, Dr. McJay, <laughs> with us, as you were called by New York Times. And I love one of your famous TED Talk, Why 30 is Not the New 20. Oh, and, thank you. Yeah, specifically from this book, The 20 Something Treatment. What yeah, I really like, because um, our podcast is called Escape 9 to 5, is not okay. necessarily to ask people to escape. It's just my way to interview interesting people and show other people who has been in a corporate environment. There is a different way of living. There is people okay. who are creating a portfolio life. <laughs> So I want to quote you from this chapter seven. You have this paragraph say that, so whatever your current job might happen to be, your real job as a 20 something is to get out there and get some skills, personal, professional, and financial, and even emotional stability comes from having identity capital that is transportable across jobs and or locations. These are skills you can take with you into the futures as your jobs come and go and jobs will come and go. So, um, and I also, I found out about the this new book when I was listening to Adam Grant's um, podcast, mm -hmm. Rethinking. And in the podcast, you said that 20 somethings to really choose their adventure, know, know who you are and what you want to do. So this really ties to the theme of the podcast and I mm -hmm. really, really appreciate your time. So oh, it's my pleasure. Welcome again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so usually I start the podcast by two truths and a lie. Okay, so, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I can ask you uh, to share two truths and a lie about your 20-somethings with okay. us. Okay, I was a college dropout at 20. I lived in my car for five years in my 20s, and I got four tattoos in my 20s. Wow. The first one is you're at college. In, a college in dropout. So I, at 20, I had dropped out of college. At 20, that's my first item. Mm, I think it's the third one. That I have the, four tattoos? You think that's, that's the lie? The, yeah, maybe I have three. You're good. Yeah, that's the lie. I have no tattoos. I'm like <laughs> a rare species or, you know, individual at this point. I have zero tattoos. Um, yeah, probably because I'm not a big fan of needles, but, um, you know, yeah. I also am not a big fan of permanence. So maybe that's it too, but uh, no tattoos. Yeah, that's, that's something actually, I sometimes I look, in, look at people's tattoos because I have no tattoos either. Okay. And I was mm -hmm. feeling like if you have a tattoo when you're 22, let's say you just randomly put something in your body and then you have 
when you're 35 or 45 you you regret it i think that's yeah, it yeah 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 you better better really like it yeah i'm not a big fan of permanence so um so mm-hmm. i think that's part of it but even especially in my 20s it was more about the needles that wasn't going to happen um yeah. but the other two are true so you drop out of college when you're 20 what, what happened there i, I only read it in your book you're doing your phd and then there's a lot of ups and downs and you yeah just- yeah um i dropped out i'd left college i started at one school and i didn't really like it um well i liked it i liked it for the first year and then i by the second year i was sort of over it and i kind of flamed out so i um I had good grades, but I just like wasn't into it and I didn't, I was spending a lot of money and I just wasn't feeling it. So um, I actually had a boyfriend at the time and we left school together and moved out West and I took a gap year. I mean, I don't know that it was a gap year per se. I just worked my tush (laughs) off and then college looked a lot better after that. So um, I went back. So I did go back to college and I finished, but I was, um, kind of out, uh, it started my twenties by kind of being a a bit lost. I think that's the feeling for most of the people. Was that also the time that you were living in a car? Is that your second? That was, uh, after college, (laughs) Uh, but that was when, um, I wrote about it in the defining decade. I had a job as an outdoor educator. So I traveled all around the country and took people on these outdoor education programs. So I didn't need an apartment for five years. I mean, I lived, I spent 200 days a year in the back country, like living in a tent. So the other days of the year, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to pay for a rent for all that. So, you know, I just traveled in between. So I, I didn't have an apartment for five years. That's so cool. It was that's great. Like, it was awesome, the, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's the start. You are the pioneer of digital nomads. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There was no digital, but I was a nomad. I was an early van life adopter. Yes, um, for sure. And as people are discovering, it can be fun for a minute and it gets old. Um, so that's that's just normal. I did have fun for a while. And then after a while, I was like, wow, you know, time is passing me by. Yeah, I think that's a common um, experience for many of the 20 somethings. So if you had to create a playlist that defines your 20s, what are the three songs that will definitely be on it and why? Well, you were kind enough to send a few questions beforehand, because it, which is a good thing, I have to say, because people need a chance to think about this one. But yeah. what was interesting is I thought, ooh, that I'm going to need a chance to think about that. And then three popped into my head. And what was interesting was that the three that popped into my head, like totally mapped on to the three books that I've written. So it's, I'm a little unclear, like what you're getting out of my subconscious there, the three books I've written or my twenties or yeah. the combination. But uh, one was Pink Floyd's time, which I actually quote at the beginning of the defining decade. And cause I think like many 20 somethings, I was sort of grappling with this feeling of like, Oh, I have all the time in the world. I'll just waste a bunch of time. But then also feeling like time is really catching up to me. And does my life matter? Am I going to do anything with it? So I think that was sort of the existential song for me in my twenties. I did listen to it a lot when I was driving around, um, chasing the sunsets, which I think they talk about in that song. Um, yeah. uh, m ms Lose Yourself, um, mm-hmm. because I was very scrappy. Um, everything I have, I've worked for myself, um, you know, really scraped and clawed to get from van life into a PhD at Berkeley. That was not an easy transition. So I really worked for that one. Um, so I was a, I was a pretty scrappy person mm-hmm. and, you know, was definitely kind of battling to make it through my twenties into, you know, what I have now, which is a pretty good life. Um, definitely one that I worked for. Um, and then the other one, no, I do love both of those songs. This other one, I mean, I liked it in my twenties. I wouldn't say it's a favorite song. I never listened to it now, but it did pop into my head. So I'm just going to be honest. And it was REM's, um, everybody hurts, which I definitely struggled like emotionally in my twenties. And, you know, the 20 something treatment is about that's Mm -hmm. so does, so do most people that it's like very normal to have some low lows in your twenties. So that song, I had memories of 
also driving around and like, you know, tears streaming down my face <laughs> with that song playing on repeat. So it's all very tortured to remember. But um, so, yeah, so the then the scrappy song actually goes with my other book that I've written, um, Super Normal. Yeah. Which is about growing up with adversity and having a better life for yourself when you're older. So, so anyhow, it was, it's funny. I think the songs mirror my books, but I think my books mirror me and like what came out of my twenties. Yeah. I think a lot of the times songs actually, um, they remind you a period of time, which is why I have that question song. Mm -hmm. Like, a good one sometimes i hear one song and then i put it away for several years and then the second i listen to one beat of the song that immediately brought me back to that moment the specific yeah, of course uh, what, what i think what happens is because i because i'm a huge uh, taylor swift fan so i went oh to, nice okay yeah You're i Swifty. went to the con uh -huh. concerts in lisbon um, two Ooh, months nice. ago yeah then i was i realized that so many songs that's deeply ingrained in all my memories i didn't even Notice mm. that because I'm the same age as Taylor Swift. Okay. And then, well, when when she wrote the so song, so you grew up with her. Yes. So mm -hmm. so when she wrote the song 22, I was 22. But it's oh, a different wow. feeling when I now listen to 22 compared to mm -hmm. the time when I first listened to that song. So, right. Yeah. I I was like, this is actually a, a nice question to have, and it also leads to our next question because. It must be it must be very tough to be a twenty somethings as I read in your book or understand. Um, but you, I think it's always a good thing that actually twenty somethings is the ones that we pick to choose our adventures. It's, you already mentioned and uh, give us some hints about your own adventure. Like, mm -hmm. what is the most adventurous thing that you did in your twenties that you think everyone should try at least once? Uh, well, I think ironically, so what I did for my first job, like I said, I was a, an outdoor educator. So I took people on like climbing trips, canoeing trips, like that was my job. So I think people would probably think that was the most adventurous. I don't know that it was adventurous to me because I was doing it all the time. And um, mm -hmm. so I, what came to my mind when you at when uh, with that question was um, moving to San Francisco, um, because I think it's honestly a lot harder to move to a big city and find mm -hmm. work and pay the bills and figure out transportation and like all the things, um, you know, all by myself. I didn't, I mean, I might've known a couple of people out there. I think moving to a big city and having to scrap it out and figure it out um, was the most adventurous thing I did um, because for me, you know, rock climbing or backpacking was a lot easier than that. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of the, of my friends, because I grew up in China and then I just, I moved to the U.S. for my grad school. So okay. I arrived in the U.S. when I was 22. And a lot of the things that is very different from real, from textbook, because you can only learn so much by right. watching from afar. And a lot of my friends, because of the nature of like me moving around, my, my friends are sort of the same. So I feel like that is actually echoes with a lot of the experience and and discussions that I had with my friends mm, as well. Mm -hmm. like, I mean, I think it's a great, I, I, I think if you can sort of show up in a new place and, you know, create a life, it's an amazing skill. And, you know, talking about having skills that go with you everywhere you go, just knowing I can figure it out wherever I go, I think is a really important skill to have just to know like, well, yeah, sure. I don't see the need to do that anytime soon, but I, I could if I had to. Yeah, I yeah. think that's one of the skills that wasn't talked about that much because you couldn't really quantify it. I have mm -hmm. a question for you is like, what's one skill you picked up in your 20s that you never expected to be so useful? I don't know what it, what it yeah, is. Yeah, actually, yeah, that one, that is a, is a, well, I guess somewhat quantifiable, but it, it's teaching. So I taught mm -hmm. a lot in my 20s. I taught at Outward Bound, doing all the outdoor education. Then I taught test prep. So, yeah. you know, like standardized tests. I was like a standardized test whiz and taught. And I mean taught like 30 hours a week. Like I taught the MCAT three times in a row on Saturday, like two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the early afternoon, two and a half hours in the late afternoon, plus, you know, five nights a week and two afternoons. So wow. if you can teach, um, no, I didn't want to like 
be a teacher, like a second grade teacher, but you know, if you can teach, you can talk, you can come on a podcast and talk, you can give a Ted talk, you can be a college professor. A lot of what I do in sessions with clients, which I talk about in my books, it's not really therapy as much as it is psychoeducation. I'm giving people better information than what they had. So anyhow, I mean, teaching is a great skill and it's mm -hmm. kind of a backdoor into being a good public speaker because you're just very comfortable talking in front of a group and conveying information. So it's actually teaching. Oh, yeah. My late grandpa, he's a college professor. Okay. So I always have a lot of uh, respect for teachers. And I, I thought about this sentence. It says that the best way to learn is to teach. Yes, so yes, right. Unavoidably, every single day, our interaction with each other is always a way, a form of teaching. So I think we all need to learn the way to like better teach ourselves and others. Because the theme of this podcast, because you mentioned in your book, you have a lot of flexibility in your work life as of mm -hmm. now. But yeah. I get it's because you're way up there in your career. Was there a specific turning point that granted you this agency or is it like a gradual process? Or it's always like that for it? I think like many 20 somethings, I, you know, I initially was working in the outdoors because I like didn't want to be chained to a desk. You know, the man wasn't going to get me down. So I was going to go like do something, you know, where I could just be out there totally flexible, et cetera, et cetera. But then besides getting tired of van life and all that, I also realized like, well, without a really great skill set, I'm eventually going to be quite constrained, you know, and I wanted to, um, you know, I did want to be in the helping professions. I thought I probably wanted to be a clinical psychologist. You got to get a PhD for that. So I like you know, made the hugest pivot in the world from like rock climbing instructor to like PhD student at Berkeley. But, um, so, uh, so I was quite constrained during those seven hellish years as a PhD student at Berkeley, no offense to Berkeley, but kind of, um, it was super hard, super constraining, um, quite tough difficult, life. uh, very tough life. However, once I had my degree, I was a free agent and I could do whatever I wanted. And I decided not to go into academia, even though at Berkeley, that's what everybody wants you to do. You need to go be a tenure track professor, blah, blah, blah. The last thing I wanted to do was to be constrained by being a tenure track professor um, and just having to like publish, publish research stats, you know, not to mention academia is not all that female friendly. So I said, I'm going to take that PhD and I'm going to do what I want to do. And I never worked for anyone again or, you know, barely here and there. Like I'm at University of Virginia now, but like I only go over there on Wednesdays and work at student health because I love the clients. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, basically had a degree, which in my field was the degree that you need so that you can just go be a free agent. So that was like the minute I got that piece of paper, I was actually nine months pregnant <laughs> and was like, okay, so now I'm going to do work and family my way, my terms. And, you know, other than, of course, you, I have to do what I have to do to, you know, pay my mortgage and whatever, but I've done it in a way that suited me um, pretty much the whole time. You've deserved it when you can become your free agent, like the seven years yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's hard. No, I'm sure people do that without ever having their, you know, seven years of servitude and graduate school or whatever, or, but I could not have gotten to where I wanted to get without sort of getting that mm. career bump through the degree. And so I think for many, actually, somebody just sent me an email couple days ago saying they work with 20 somethings. It was another social worker. And she was saying a lot of people sort of complaining, like, you know, my 20 something job doesn't have a lot of purpose. It's not what I want. It's not, you know, whatever. I mean, I get it. Been there, done that. Um, but I guess the question is, can it get you to that eventually that, you know, I'm able to have a job that's on my terms and has tons of purpose and meaning you know, because of the identity capital and the skills and the learning that I kind of socked in in my 20s. So I guess the question is like, not do I have my dream job now, but can I get there from here? That was sort of my journey. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I think back to my 20s, I was very lost because 
you know, the Chinese, you'd be a lawyer, doctor, banker. So I'd become right. a banker. Or, yes, and I was right. like completely lost. This one time I went to Colombia, like a forum, it's called One Young World. So then they gather mm. change makers. And I was there, I was like, looking at all these people. They have amazing resumes, like 30 under 30. Right. I, I was like, my whole life like every day is just making powerpoints and excel right. spreadsheets and right. <laughs> be on call 24 7. but mm. now i look back because now i'm working on my own uh venture to see how i can bridge the financing gap for climate technology companies oh cool so mm. even though i just started but there's no way i can confidently tell people i want to do this and i'm the perfect i'm the right people to do this if i don't have those 10 that years background. of background so I think it's actually tied to my next question for you, because I I didn't read the book, this Defining Decade. I would definitely need to make that up because I, I, I really need that when I was 20 something. Right. So, <laughs> your previous book, The Defining Decade, is focused on the transformational nature of the 20s. Mm -hmm. And then the new book just addresses the difficulties, but also provide a step by step guide. Like how do these two books complement each other? If people haven't read any of them, which one should they start? Yeah. Um, well, they should definitely read both. The Defining Decade is really about why your 20s are so important and so foundational and also just the easiest time to sort of change and get what you want and become the person you want to be eventually, not necessarily by 24 or whatever. So it's really, I think culturally, we sort of roll our eyes at 20 somethings and, you know, play them small of like, eh, whatever, 30s, new 20, 20s don't matter that much. Developmentally, nothing could be further from the truth. So much is happening in your 20s. So the book is really about how to help people tap into that and create the lives that they want, ones they're going to feel good about in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. The 20-something treatment is a very different book. It's really more about young adult mental health, um, which you know everybody's talking about now. As a matter of fact, when I wrote The Defining Decade, I mean, I was a clinical psychologist back then too, and I had a chapter in the book about mental health and my editor was like no no don't put that in there like just just make this book something every average 20 something can relate to and i was like well i hate to break it to you but every average 20 something is dealing with mental health struggles and he's like yeah yeah but like that's a different book make this you know the graduation gift that everybody needs so I, it was actually mm -hmm. really good advice because mental health is more than just like a chapter yeah um so now you know 10 years later, everybody's talking about mental health, which yeah. is, which is good, not good, depending on what the conversation is. And so, you know, I think it's 20 somethings have long been the age group most likely to struggle with their mental health. That's been true since I've been doing this for 25 years. It's been true the entire time. We're just only now talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's great to talk about it in terms of like, hey, this is normal. This is how you get through it versus like you have four diagnoses and need 15 medications um, because, you know, most people don't. So the 20 something treatment is really about why your 20s are so difficult and why we really have to take an age specific approach to mental health. It's not a one size fits all. So I'm thinking very differently about a 24 year old who's having trouble, you know, regulating their emotions than a 44 year old who's having trouble doing that. Those are two different things. I think I was lucky in a way because growing up, my I would I grew up in China, but one of the biggest city in China. So I've been in the GDP trajectory is just going up every single year. Mm -hmm. But in our system, there's no such thing as mental health. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I was in my twenties, I was like, this sucks every single day. It just sucks. So it's maybe hard. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah, but I didn't put whatever ADHD or like panic attack in my own uh, right scenario whereas as i grew older my cousin he's, he's 10 years younger than me and now he's in mm -hmm. new york i remember a few years back when i talked to him he's like i have panic attack i was like what is that you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and then a lot of my friends they start to have all of these terms i think in your book you also talk about uh, the nocebo effects like people mm -hmm. are just using this term as if it's like justify of some maybe a month or two months of tough period when i was 28 i feel like my life is going nowhere because i had my ex-boyfriend at the time we're not going anywhere 
and I felt like my job was not going anywhere. If it's now, I would definitely like give myself some kind of r i t m e n or something. But right. at the time, I just had no other way rather than going to the gym, and that has happened to be the best thing happening in my life after the breakup because it completely changed me to someone who's more confident. I think mm. it's because of the the fact that it changed. The how our brain functions, and mm-hmm. I just have the courage and strength to pick myself up out of a very difficult period of time, and that right. becomes the foundation. And I think it's also what you talk about in your book. You discuss that twenties is probably the toughest time, and contrary to conventional sayings, it's like well, the life is actually going up there. It's really reassuring because I feel like maybe it's just me, but I look mm-hmm. at all of my friends; they they kind of. When we're all in the 3 0 s now, they are more relaxed, like more self-assured. So mm-hmm. I think that's really reassuring for people who are in their 2 0 s So if you can tell us more on that one, yeah, I mean, it is the 2 0 s tend to be a mental health low point, and I say that um, you know, kind of to point to the positive that you know we life actually gets better as we go. So all the studies show pretty much in most all. Measures of you know well-being or life satisfaction or depression, anxiety, etc. That across 30s, 40s, 50s, people tend to feel happier and healthier and more successful, more confident, more competent. Everything you know, your 20s will probably not be the best years of your life, and that's actually really good news. <laughs> It also means that if you're struggling, you're not the only one. It's developmentally difficult. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, you're talking about breakups and job losses and moves, and you know. Just Just a lot of unknowns. The brain doesn't like any of those things, and it's extremely easy as a 20 s o m e t h i n g to meet criteria for different DSM disorders. It's a cinch to meet criteria for major depressive disorder, or social anxiety disorder, or generalized anxiety disorder. So I'm not saying people aren't meeting the criteria. What I'm saying is the criteria are not developmentally nuanced. So. It is very normal for a 2 2 y e a r o l d to say, "I feel really anxious around new people. I'm afraid of talking in groups. I can't stop thinking about what other people are thinking about me." And you have just met the criteria for social anxiety disorder. So, you know, I think not getting too hung up on labels in your 2 0 s and realizing that a lot of what you're going through it's real, um, but it's temporary, um, and will get better with uh, more experience, more competence, more confidence. And I wouldn't assume. That whatever you might meet criteria for at 24 is something that you'll still be grappling with at 34. Um, I mean, now there are some DSM disorders that are, you know, tend to be lifelong journeys, um, but most of what 2 0 s o m e t h i n g s are grappling with are situational and they're temporary, and they'll get better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I felt like when I was in my 2 0 s all. None of us knows what's going on. Like we also don't have a lot of tools to look up to, which is why I think your book is such a great one. Because what we have is just you talk to another person who's in the same age, who's also lost in their life, mm-hmm. and also because of the fact that uh, me and my friends, most of the most of us, we we grew up in China and then we study in abroad, and then we ended up working. Places like Hong Kong, London, or New York, everything is new. It's also difficult for us to even get advice from our own family because they haven't been there. But mm-hmm. luckily for us, we have books like uh, for the people now in their twenties. Mm-hmm. They have books like the one that you written. And one thing I want to ask is, you mentioned in the book, young adults have an average of nine jobs by the age of thirty-five. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm definitely. I didn't move that much, but every single time. I move. It's a big change. Like I lost my job and I ended up somewhere mm-hmm. better. Um, what is the best way for 20 somethings to set a sh- reassurance for themselves while facing these changes in their career paths? Yeah, I think it's to do kind of what y- you quoted earlier on in the podcast from the, the book. It's to really understand that you are gaining skills and identity capital, which I talk a lot about in the defining decade and some about in the 2 0 something treatment. That you're gaining things from these jobs that are moving around with you, and so. I think oftentimes 2 0 somethings end a job and they're like, "I didn't learn anything," and. You know, my response is that's not possible. You're just not sort of taking stock or articulating what it is 
you yes. learned or what you got good at while you're there. So, you know, as you go through your nine jobs, feel free to make a list, running list as you go of the skills that you you gained. And I don't just mean, you know, PowerPoints or Excel spreadsheets. I also mean things like running a meeting or, um, you know, receiving feedback. I mean, that there's a, a whole slew of things that you're doing day in and day out at work um, that even though the job ends, you're still capable of doing those things. And so just to remember the common denominator across those nine jobs is you, not to get too hung up on like where necessarily this is headed um, ultimately, because, you know, most people end up doing something they'd never heard of when they were 24. And so to really yeah. just go like one good opportunity at a time, one good job at a time. And, you know, by opportunity, I mean, for me working in the outdoors for five years, that was a good opportunity. I got a lot out of it that ended up being very useful in my later career, even though it wasn't like, quote unquote, a good job. So I'm using that term loosely. It should apply to you personally. But yeah. just to remember that, like what you end up sort of coming to fruition, which usually happens sometime, you know, by or around mid 30s, you, you probably can't predict it at 24. So, no. um, so don't try. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, you know, gain a bunch of skills, your learning curve maps onto your earning curve. And I don't just mean earn earning in terms of money, but also in terms of freedom, flexibility, competence, confidence, all that. I like the chapter seven, when you talked about how to work, you have this client, you help her list out all the things that she learned at work. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I write, wrote it down from that one is how to realize it's not the end of the world if something blows up at work or if the whole company blows up. Because when right. we're in 20s, we just graduated from school. In school, you have the grading system. Everything has A, B, C, and D. And then right. when you're at work, once you blow up something, if especially um, if you're a great student and then you just kind of feel like, oh, no, I, I have screwed up for my mm -hmm. entire life. Right. Kind of, yeah. I think it's really hard for um, to go from school to the workplace where in school you constantly knew quantitatively exactly where you stood on any given day of like, well, I'm an 84 or I'm a 92, yeah. you know, like you knew that. And in the workplace, you don't really know that. You're not really sure where you stand. You're not necessarily going to get the grades. And it's also like your screw ups aren't sort of just between you and you anymore. I mean, you know, in college, it's like, oh, well, if I fail a test, that's between me, myself and I. My professor is not going to be like, we need to talk, um, you know, at work your your failed test has implications beyond your transcript. And so I think that's yeah. a, a lot more stressful. Sometimes we, we didn't know that a lot of things are out of our control. And we also don't know when we screw up something at work, especially when we're junior team members at a team. Maybe other people, they have their fair share of uh, responsibility as well. It's just they, they know better. They know that something else will happen again, then they can fix that. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about, because um, like in our early 20s, we should just learn as much as possible so that we earn this identity capital. I want to ask specifically is how can individual realistically cultivate this identity capital outside of the traditional work environment? Maybe you have talked about it in the defining decade. I should definitely read it. The, the reason why I ask is sometimes it feels like job is the entire thing end up especially in the traditional professional service industry you end right. up being if i'm a banker i'm a banker like 24 7 it's very hard to even have something else outside of that and sometimes i feel like it's also maybe nowadays it has changed but in the past when i started it i don't feel like it's encouraged mm -hmm. to have some other stuff right? Yeah, I mean, sort of in the big sense, you know, I, I did talk about in the defining decade and I mentioned earlier in the podcast, my first job. At, so I went to University of Virginia for undergrad, which is, you know, not exactly a bad school. And my first job out of college was like teaching rock climbing, which was definitely not what my family had in mind um, yeah. to, to come out of my college degree. Um, but it ended up being great identity capital internally and externally, internally, 
you know, for five years, I basically helped people get from A to B through some very difficult circumstances, situations, rock cliffs, thunderstorms, you know, emergencies, like I can handle anything and figure it out because that was my job. And so that was really good confidence, competence building for me that, you know, when I did pivot and went to Berkeley for grad school, I had confidence that a lot of my classmates didn't have, which is around like, whatever, this is nothing. I, I've, I've been, I've done more, more, more challenging and riskier things, which was honestly true. I mean, grad yeah. school may have been more hellish, but it definitely wasn't like harder yeah. than what I'd been doing. Um, but also on the outside, when, so at Berkeley for grad for clinical psych grad school, um, they're still on the mentor system. So they only take like one student per professor. So they took five, they take about five people a year. So I was literally the only person of the five who did not go to an Ivy league. Although again, UVA is no like schlub school, but, mm -hmm. um, didn't go to an Ivy league, hadn't been sort of working in a lab, you know, over the, <laughs> previous years. Um, but what I'd been doing was super interesting. And mm -hmm. so when I went into interviews, everybody was like, Oh, tell me about outward bound. And I was sort of ready to talk statistics and research <laughs> and had kind of gotten my brain back into that and had started interning in a lab to sort of say, Hey, I'm serious. I know what I'm getting into, but nobody wanted to talk about that. They all wanted to talk about outward bound. And that was true for a long time. So I guess what I'm saying is, oftentimes doing something that's not the norm is actually how you stand out. And I was actually giving a talk at, I think it was Deloitte once, speaking yeah. of people who were working 24 seven, all in the yeah. same way. <laughs> some cool 20 something was saying that she had taken the time to do some kind of like wine tasting class or something. Yeah. And people were like, don't do that. You don't have time. That's going to ruin things. I mean, the fact that you don't have time to take a wine tasting class as a consultant is very sad, but um, she, is. she like figured out, like found the time she did this. And then it ended up being this cool thing about her where she was like leading these little like wine tasting something or others at Deloitte, or, you know, you go to these cocktail parties mm -hmm. and she can talk about her wine tasting chops. And so, um, you know, there are big ways and small ways to do, um, to, to earn bits of identity capital. And sometimes the ones that are more surprising or offbeat um, end up carrying you further. I would much rather have someone on my team who was, you know, like played, on the golf team in college than who yeah. had four majors and three minors. It's like, whatever, like everybody can do that. <laughs> well, not everybody, but everybody thinks they need to do that. I would much rather have the person who was on the golf team. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It really resonated with me a lot because I grew up in a very traditional setting. And then for some reason, last time when I lost my job, it's coincide with the time that I started my YouTube channel. Oh, okay. and I, just, mm -hmm. I have that YouTube channel forever. I have 1000 something subscribers is nothing, but yeah, it yeah. builds up some kind of identity capital for myself. So yeah. the second time last year, when I, I, I'd have to lead the team, I wasn't feeling that much stress anymore. I, mm -hmm. and I know that YouTube is not going <laughs> to give any, be the thing, mm -hmm. pay, pay the, be the thing, but it gives me a different set of identity that I know that I can create something. Mm -hmm. I have the consistency and resilience to, to do something out, out of my own interest. And that's actually give me the confidence to reach out to people like yourself. And I, I end up starting a podcast about climate technology and then it gives me an excuse. I have all of those mm -hmm. nice. ways to reach out to people mm -hmm. where when I'm, I don't think it's, it's taught in a, a traditional corporate yeah. job. Anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what, what is the fine line you say? Cause I think in twenties we need to explore a lot. What is the fine line between exploration and procrastination when building these identities? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I have a line in my Ted talk that says something yes. like yeah. I'm not against exploration, but I am against procrastination. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I think we all know it when we're doing it. So like, I definitely did a fair bit of exploring in my twenties with my, you know, work all around the country and the outdoors and, you know, got all my van life out of my system. I also remember getting to the point where it was like, you know, let me just book, you know, five or six more courses and that'll kill six more months 
of my life. You know, like I was just like, that'll just buy me another six months before I need to deal with like what next and how am I going to pivot? And, you know, I, I knew like when I went from exploration to procrastination, that it was less about learning and growing and changing. And it was more about like killing time or avoiding or postponing, figuring out what's next. For the we sake all, of you know, we all know when we're there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it. Sometimes it, it's like you sign up for another thing just to just to be it. like, okay, well, I'm booked now, you yeah. know. So that then I didn't have to deal with, okay, shoot, what's what's going to happen when this ends? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good way to think about it. So speaking of identity, I, I mentioned it a, a little bit because I grew up in China and I move around now. I live in London. I spent my time in London and Lisbon. Um, I'm just curious because you have some clients that you mentioned in the book, they're from a Western culture and an Eastern culture. If you've noticed any interesting facts about people from different culture backgrounds going through their 20s, like... Uh Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if they're interesting facts and I don't want to fall into like stereotypes, yeah, but yeah. I would say often, um, you know, Western kids are sort of raised to like follow your dreams, explore, don't settle down too early, don't chain yourself to a desk, blah, 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 which, you know, can have its upsides, but can also sort of lead people astray in terms of like, whoa. I thought I could just follow my dreams and everything was going to work out. Like it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I think um, kids with, you know, Eastern backgrounds, many have been taught like, don't follow your <laughs> dreams. Follow, where the, you know, follow, the <laughs> follow my dreams, which yeah. are for you to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. Yes. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So it's, you know, as you well said, there are two or three paths forward. And if you don't do that, like your life is over. And that's yes. not true either. <laughs> So I'm often trying to get people to sort of be somewhere in the middle. I think there's, you know, something to be said for both ends of that spectrum. And it's probably, you know, that that middle point of like exploration and commitment or exploration and hard work of, you know, making sacrifices. Mm -hmm. I mean, I ultimately wanted to be a clinical psychologist to do that. I had to do a lot of things I didn't want to do to get to where I am now, where I really do only what I want to do. And I've been doing only what I wanted to do for like quite some time. So it wasn't exactly like a bad trade-off. Um, but, you know, like I couldn't start writing books in my 20s because I didn't have anything to write about. Like I, <laughs> I wasn't doing anything. I didn't know anything. I wasn't an expert in anything. What was I going to write about? Um, yeah. So, you know, I didn't get to do everything. I, I didn't get to follow all my dreams um, mm -hmm. in my I 20s. I think it's a middle ground there in that. Mm -hmm. But if you like, it, would you, of course, individually, it's an individual case, but would you, in a general sense, how would you... Uh, would you suggest different things to focus on for people from a Western background growing up or an Eastern background growing up? Um, I guess I would just say for both, just that combination of exploration and commitment, yeah. that some yeah. exploration is great. Even students, I mean, I work with a fair number of college students and they come in and they're like, I'm definitely biomedical engineering. It's like, well, <laughs> cool. That's great. I'm not going to try to talk you out of that, but there's like a lot of ways you could go within biomedical engineering. So like do some exploration there. Like you probably haven't even heard of where this is going to go for you. So, you know, let yourself feel like there's some choice and some play and some exploration. Mm. Um, yeah. And then, Definitely. yeah. yeah. So, so out of, you have this uh, part two of your book, you have 11 skills, how to, how mm -hmm. to, how to, um, if you had to pick one of the most fundamental out of that 11, w which would be it and why? Uh, actually it wouldn't, it would be sort of the meta, which was, you know, which is sort of what the book was about, but I didn't make it a specific how to, cause it's so meta um yeah. it's really how to how to tolerate uncertainty how to live with uncertainty mm -hmm. because you know really all of those skills of how to think how to feel how to work how to love are all about how to think when you're uncertain how to feel when you're uncertain how to deal with uncertainty at work how to deal with uncertainty in love so just that sense of you know 
understanding that uncertainty is about problem solving, not about panicking. Um, so, so it would really, if I could gift all 20 something, something, it would be, you know, this ability to sort of tolerate life's uncertainty and move forward in all of those areas instead of wanting everything to be known. Yeah. Cause it's uncertainty is the only certain thing in life. I feel like. right. That's right. Yeah. My next question is tightly uh, connected to this answer is you mentioned this J curve several times in um, uh, also in your interview with Adam Grant, like the J curve mental health curve. Mm -hmm. um, how is there any daily practice that we can adopt because human brain, we don't think about better things in the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. just protect us. But is there, if there is any one daily practice someone can adopt when they start practicing, imagining the best possible life for themselves, especially yeah. in a difficult situation. Well, I mean, actually that, that, um, so, th uh, when people are feeling uncertain, the brain perceives that as danger and it yeah. starts to sort of like play out the catastrophes. Oh my God, I'm going to get fired. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to find someone. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to pay my bills. It always imagines the worst. That's what the brain needs to do to keep you alive. Yeah. Great. Um, so, but in addition to that, can we, cause you probably can't get your brain to like not do that. It happens so quickly, but can you spend a little bit of time sort of balancing that? Well, let me imagine life going well. Um, that we don't spend a lot of time imagining what if this, what if my life goes well, what does that look like? And that mm -hmm. helps us sort of tap into our hopes and dreams and also gives our brain, you know, the experience of, you know, visualizing like, Hey, I could be happy and healthy and successful five years from now or six months from now. And what would that look like for me? Because the automatic brain is going to do the negative almost every time. Um, but that doesn't mean that's what's true or even what's authentic. It's just what's automatic. So can you spend some time thinking about, you know, what are my authentic hopes and dreams? Like, what if this goes well, what would that look like? And then the fun question is, what do I need to do to get now there. to get there? Um, then that means you've probably got some work to do. Yeah. And that, often usually motivates. I think you, I, I actually watched one of your interview and TED talk when you talk about, we should treat our future self as our best friend. Mm, Maybe that's, mm -hmm. that's one way to do it as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you can share, um, what's, cause you've been doing this with the 20 somethings for 25 years. If it, yeah. if it, there's one piece of memory that stand out in your journey as a developmental psychologist and author, what's the best one that you can think of now? Oh my gosh. Um, that, you know, there's just not a best one other than I just adore 20 somethings. I definitely would have imagined I would have moved on by now to something else of like, even when I wrote the defining decade, I was like, well, I've got nothing else to say about that time to move on. But I didn't actually not because I didn't have anything else to talk about, but because, you know, the twenties for me are still so important um, 20 somethings as a group are so delightful. I love working with them. I love feeling like I'm making a difference in someone's life when it can really matter a lot. So it's almost like my memories of that are, are just getting better. Like I enjoy it more now than I ever have, um, which is, was, is very unexpected. Yeah, that's great. Like every day you're making an impact in somebody's life and which is for their next, the rest of their life. Yeah, it must yeah, be a great feeling. When I read the book, I really like your professor in UC Berkeley. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember he told you, uh, "Let me know what happens uh, when you f um, spoke to her him the last time." So right. if, if you were to leave a sentence for our audience, like you finished months of office hours with them, and they've just gone through something really hard and ready to go out there and take on the world, what would you say to them? You know, I, I'm going to say I, I learned from my professor and I still remember that 30 years later because that, that is what I would say. And I do it, I do it all the time. There's this sense whenever I'm done working with someone of like, let me know how you are. Let me know where you are. Let me know what happens because I generally think life is probably going to go better than they think it will. And they're probably going to have lots of good news to share. And, um, 
I really believe that and I look forward to hearing about it and I want to hear about it. I think sometimes 20 somethings, including myself when I was in my 20s, underestimate how much other people care and they don't realize like, oh, that person who wrote me a letter of reference, I should probably tell them where I ended up going to grad school, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or I should probably tell them what happened, you know, that yeah. that they actually care about you. So I would I would say, let me know what happens for, for the, both reasons. I'm expecting good things and people really care. They want to know um, what's happening in your life. Yeah, that's a good piece of advice because I started to reach out to people who have decision powers uh, last time when I lost my job. And then I, I realized actually people, they would love to hear your updates. And sometimes Definitely. when we're young and we don't have any power in our hands, we sometimes feel like we might not be in a position to reach out to them because they're busy, blah, blah, blah. But I realize now they actually want to hear what you've been doing. So absolutely. So yeah, so let me know what happens is almost <laughs> always what I say when people leave me of like, hey, no pressure, but would love to hear from you anytime. And I, I really mean that. Yeah, yeah. So let's move move above the 20s and see what happens in people's 30s. Okay. So 80% of the defining moments occur by age 35. I'm going to turn 35 this year in October. Okay. And can you elaborate this a little bit more for people who are approaching this age? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, yes. Well, let me say, um, you know, I, I guess I'm known for saying 30 is not the new 20. But I also have said very clearly in my books, life is not over at 30. Um, <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, most of the good big stuff happens in your 30s and beyond. It's just your 20s sort of set you on a path for like a lot of what comes to fruition in your 30s. Mm -hmm. So I was giving a talk yesterday and I showed a slide of me 35 holding my diploma from Berkeley, nine months pregnant, you know, about to start my private practice and like go out on my own. And um, so that was so a joke, like oh, I was just getting them all in under the wire, which is true. Um, but what was really happening is that the work I put in in my 20s was coming to fruition. And so I don't know about you, Lydia, but most people would say their 30s are definitely better than their 20s. And they oh, yes. wouldn't, wouldn't go back for a million dollars. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I love 30 somethings. I really do. It's there's no reason I it's not like I don't work with them because I think it's too late for them. But I just think, you know, they're sort of past the like course correction formative years and they're really into the meat of things and often mm. kind of know what they're doing and so their struggles are more around well my job is hard or my partnership is hard or raising kids is hard and like you know it's different than 20 somethings that are like i don't know what i'm doing but um yeah. Like we so, kind of know what we're doing now. You know what you're doing and it's, and it's, you're into it and it's, it's hard. Um, so, you know, I guess I would just say, um, I mean, to me, my, you know, 35 to 55, I mean, I'm at 55 now have just been like such great 20 years, like work done fully, you know, enjoying the fruits of my labor, not meaning I don't still work a, very hard but like it's i do it the what i yeah. want to do now and yeah. that's really been great it's time to enjoy all the hard work that you've put in yeah when you're in your 20s so like what's the best way for us to make good use of this decade like the 30s just keep building on um I mean, I guess, you know, just kind of digging into, I think now you're more in a position to really say like, okay, I've got the foundational skills or I've got those starter jobs. I've got, I've got, the, you know, the resume builders, the identity capital, but what do I want to do with it now? So, you know, 35 was basically when I graduated from Berkeley and was like, peace out on the whole tenure track thing. I'm not doing that, not interested in that. I'm going to go do what I want to do. And I remember when I was doing my, my residency, like, so from Berkeley, you know, I got interviews everywhere, like Yale Child Study yeah. Center and Stanford and like all these places. I wanted to go to UVA, to the student health, because I wanted to specialize in young adults. And they had like the best student health center in the country. And Berkeley was like 
apoplectic that I would want to do that when mm -hmm. I could go to all these sort of like kind of glamorous resume builder residencies. But I was like, I'm done building my resume. I already know what I want to do and I want to go do it now. And yeah. So um, I, I guess think to summarize this, like it's this decade is what we have already known who we are as a person. So we can just go, go start doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Just to do it. Yeah. yeah. So whether that's like, hey, I'm going to step back from work a little or figure out how to focus on family also, or whether it's I'm going to do this rather than that. I mean, yeah. your 30s are really your chance to make that turn. That's a good, your 30s is your chance to make that turn. <laughs> so I watched your TED talk. You have this line, you say that you have this aha moment. 30 is not the new 20. And do you have any new aha moments these days that you can um, share? You know, I think. Uh, between being a therapist for 25 years and then writing the 20 something treatment, um, you know, kind of had an aha moment or I don't know, an aha transition around like therapy is not the answer, um, for many or most people that, mm -hmm. um, I think it's a bit of a fool's errand to imagine that like the solution to all 20 something problems or mental health struggles is like everybody needs a therapist. Um, for one, it's just not affordable and accessible. Um, there are not enough therapists. And let me say there are not enough good therapists. Like yeah. there are a lot of not so good therapists and that's mm -hmm. not helpful. So, um, you know, I think therapy is really not the end all be all. And that, um, you know, what we know from how people get better in therapy is that it really comes from what's called extra therapeutic change or positive changes that happen outside of therapy. So a good therapist is not changing your life by saying smart things. They're changing your life by helping you get into better friendships, get into better yeah. jobs, get into better partnerships, better habits, better relationships with substances, better relationships with your family, et cetera. And like you don't need a therapist to do those things. Um, you know, that mental health gets better when life gets better, you know, not when you get a big expensive therapist. Life is the best teacher of all. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's go through a lightning round. Okay. So, uh, besides your own book, do you have other books that you think 20 somethings to read and why? Uh, the book that if I were on a deserted island, I could only have one book. It would actually be the Tao Te Ching from China. Um, and Ooh. it, yeah, it, that is an amazing, if you want to calm the blank down in your twenties, um, you could read, you should put the Tao in your pocket. I actually love the, there's a pocket edition translated by mm -hmm. Stephen Mitchell. Um, every time I teach a class on positive psychology, that's one of the required readings, um, because I think nice. it's just really good for your head. And, um, I've yeah. kept it in my purse on and off for 35 yeah. years. We'll put a, put a link. Um, do you have a trick to push yourself to stay productive when you don't feel like doing something? Uh, yeah, there's a great quote by Somerset mom. I think it's something he's a writer and it's something like, I only write when the inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes every morning at 9am, which <laughs> means like you just put your butt in the chair, whether you feel like it or not. And then the work follows. So mm -hmm. I, you know, when I'm writing a book, I have a schedule, I go to a coffee shop, sit in the same stool, open my laptop and I just start working. And if I don't feel, if I'm not like feeling it, I'll read what I wrote the day before, or like I'll work on the references or I'll do a little research. So I just start. Yeah. Um, and motion then motion begets motion. Exactly. Yeah. What is, what is the worst career advice you've ever received? And what's the best advice you would give to 20 somethings and 30 somethings? Um, I don't know if anybody ever told me to follow my dreams. <laughs> But that would have probably not that you shouldn't ultimately try to achieve them, but I don't know if like following them is necessarily yeah. the way to get there. But, um, you Maybe know, just that sense, is the better way. yeah, or uh, uh, achieve it, you know, or mm -hmm. build it, make it happen. Yeah, build um, it. you know, I think just that sense of people shrugging me off of like, oh, you're fine, just sort of idealizing, you know, being in your 20s, enjoy it while you can because it's actually pretty hard. <laughs> so, um, mm. all that, yeah. What is the uh, one thing you hope to accomplish in the next decade and you haven't 
tackle yet if you have one well i you know i when i saw that question i was actually surprised pleasantly surprised that my answer was what i want to accomplish in the next decade is what i'm currently it's not stuff i haven't tackled yet which tells you how much i love what i'm doing so mm. i want to write another book you know i want to keep working with 20 some things. I mean, it's just what I love doing. And, um, you know, so the, a new book is always a new undertaking, but, um, yeah. there's just, you know, I'm very, very happy with what I'm doing. That's really a good position to be in life. And if you could have any superpower to help with your work, what would it be? Oh, it would be an amazing, uh, fairy God publicist, um, that, uh, books, no matter how good your book is or isn't, it doesn't matter if people don't know about it. And yeah. publicity is sort of the weak link in the book world. You know, mm -hmm. it's just very, very hard. I'm not saying publicists are like not are bad. I'm just saying it's very hard is to get the publicity that you need um, for your book to sort of be known. And, I, you know, I write books to help people and they're not going to help people if they don't know about it. So I would have a fairy god publicist who would just help everybody know that the books exist and if they want to read them, great. And if they don't, that's fine too. Oh, great. Um, so you have a question from the previous guest. So he oh, asked, cool. Okay. He asked, what's something you've been really obsessed with in your life and why? And what have you learned from that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I am just a, a lifelong learner. I'm just like obsessed personally with like growing and learning and changing. And like, I'm constantly trying to learn new things and I'm constantly going to new places. And so, you know, that just never gets old for me. And um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, I guess learning. I'm obsessed with growth and change. So you let leave a question for the next guest too. I mean, I guess it would be, um, something we talked about earlier that if you can imagine your life going well, what does that look like? And what does that mean you need to be doing about it? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's such it was a great conversation. Talk. Yeah, yeah great it's, conversation. it's really great to talk to you. And you really did your homework, which makes the interview a lot easier. So thank you for that. I love the book. I love all the interviews. It really helps me a lot. I wish I had known your work when I was in my 20s. And oh, well. I will let you know how it goes. <laughs> Good. Please do. Yes. Thank you, Lydia. Okay. Take Thank care. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. Bye.